All right, Emma. So um, we did T for terrorism last time. Um, we're going to address a couple of these other issues. Uh, and then on Tuesday, we'll do 9-11. We'll introduce 9-11. So let's finish off the 90s before we move into that. OK? So S, we'll make S for gay rights. So the 1990s is where the gay rights movement really um, starts to pick up a lot of steam. Right, the gay rights movement starts in the 70s and then during the 80s it really gets kind of shut down because of AIDS. Um, and then it is gonna pick up quite a bit more in the 90s. So by 1994, um, the government's gonna pass something called Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Um, one of the big points of controversy is that gays are serving in the military. And by military law, um, the military is governed by a code of laws called the UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military I'll give it to you again. The UCMJ, it's the Uniform Code of Military Justice. It's the code of laws that, um, the code of laws that uh, uh, the military follows, right? And according to the UCMJ, you can't be gay. If you're gay, you're kicked out. Um, and so Clinton wants to welcome gays into the military, but he also can't get it passed through Congress. And so they passed Don't Ask, Don't Tell where basically soldiers don't say that they're gay and commanders can't ask if you're gay. So as long as everyone just pretends like it doesn't, isn't there, then everyone can just pretend and move on. That's the idea. Now, how well do you think this law is going to work? Did it not go super well? I think I remember like we talked a little bit about this in like a different video, but it ended up not going well because like they kept finding other ways to sort of figure out people who were gay and okay. stuff. Did like we do that. this already? Did we do this already? I don't know. Cause like I haven't seen all the videos, but I remember seeing this particular slide and talking a little bit about it. Okay. Well then we can move on. If we did it already, then we'll move on. Anyway, yeah, you're right. It did not work well. <laughs> it did not it didn't work well because they kept finding ways to work around it. Mm -hmm. Um okay, so let's see. Okay, so let's deal with Okay, so I know you didn't do this part, right? Right. Okay, so let's finish off gay rights stuff. So gay rights is gonna take a huge jump in the very late 90s. And one of the big things is, um, and this is gonna sound kind of silly, but when Ellen DeGeneres comes out of the closet, right? This sounds kind of silly because she's like a TV celebrity, you know, comedian, right? Um, but when she comes out of the closet, she becomes one of the very first, like, really big, high-profile people to do this. She had, like, a really high-rated TV show. She was on primetime, right? And she comes out of the closet and says that she's gay and then also makes her character gay in the show. Um, this is going to start a series of, like, celebrities coming out of the closet. And it's also going to start a series of... TV shows where we're gonna start seeing gay characters on TV shows, okay? This is the massive, it, it's, it's gonna cause this domino effect across the country where gay people across the country are all going to start coming out of the closet and identifying themselves. Now they've of course been gay for decades, right? I mean, they've been gay for since they knew they wanted to have sex with anybody, right? And they've been, they've been gay forever, um, but they've been hiding it. For the most part. And so this is going to be the single biggest step forward in the gay rights movement because we've talked about this before. I know we've talked about this before earlier in the year when we talked about like discrimination, we talked about racism and stuff. Um, but as a general rule, it's easy for people to hate someone they've never met. Right, it's really easy for you to, if you're the kind of person who wants to hate other groups, right? Like it's easy for you to latch on to hating another group if you've never met that person before, right? And this is gonna come up after 9-11 as well with like anti-Muslim bias and stuff like that, right? Because people can say, oh, I hate, I hate Muslims, right? Well, if you're like live in some town in the middle of rural Arkansas and you've never met a Muslim in your life, it's pretty easy for you to say all Muslims equal terrorists, right? It's pretty easy for you to say something like, you know, if you're like in a little town in Montana and you've never seen a black person, right? It's easy for you to say all black people are just lazy criminals, right? 
And it's easy for you to say the same thing about gays. Oh, I can't stand gays. I hate them. They're all terrible, right? But what ends up happening, and Ellen is usually the one who's credited with really starting this movement, is what ends up happening is people start coming out and they say, oh, I hate all gays. Oh, except for, you know, Uncle Fred. Uncle Fred, I've always loved him. He's a great guy and apparently he's gay. Okay. Well, I guess I hate all gays except for Uncle Fred. And then, and then like, you know, a month later, like, oh, I hate all gays except for Uncle Fred. Oh, and I guess my coworker, my coworker, Jennifer, right? I didn't know she was a lesbian, but I guess she is. So I guess I hate all gays except for Fred, Uncle Fred, and my coworker, Jennifer, right? And you say, oh, I guess I hate all gays except for, except for those two. Oh, plus, you know, uh, my cousin, my cousin's also gay. Oh, wait, well, and his, and his buddy's gay too. And then pretty soon you're like, I hate all gays except for Fred and Jennifer and Jose and Wanda and, right? And then at a certain point you stop and you say, huh, maybe I don't hate all gays. <laughs> you're like, you're like, <laughs> you're like, as it turns out, you know, all the gay people you've met are like fine, normal people, right? And you're like, huh, maybe I, maybe I don't actually hate gays. Mm-hmm. And it sounds kind of silly. I'm, I'm phrasing it in kind of a silly way, but that's a real phenomenon, right? Exposure to the to that group humanizes the group and makes it very difficult for you to other them. Have you heard the term yeah. othering before? Yeah. Yeah. What does it mean when I other someone? It's sort of similar to like the sort of us versus them sort of mm-hmm. thing where it's like, oh, we're this way, but there are like these outliers and those are the other people type thing. Sure, yeah. And you're saying the others, right? They're not like me, they're the others, right? Mm-hmm. Those are the the Mormons and they're all weird. The their, weirdos, yeah. They're the weirdos with all those multiple wives and stuff, right? That's the others or, you know, those are the gay people and they're all weird because they're not like me or those are the Muslims, those are the blacks or those are the whatever group you want to say. Right, whatever the group is, you can turn them into an other, and that kind of dehumanizes them. It's a lot harder to do that when your neighbor's gay, your coworker's gay, your uncle's gay, you know, the your friend from class is gay, right? Like it's it's much, much more difficult to do that. This process is going to keep going. It's going to be a trend that's going to keep going all through the 2000s and all through the 2010s. And it's it's really going to create a very, very stark difference. The younger generation is going to grow up with almost no gay prejudice, right? The millennial generation, millennials, um, if you look at like anti-gay sentiment and you're tracking this through the different generations, baby boomers have a really high percentage of anti-gay. Generation X has a high, relatively high percentage of anti-gay. Millennials have a relatively low percentage of anti-gay. And then your generation, the Zoomer generation, right? You guys aren't really a generation yet. You guys don't really count until you enter the workforce, but um, you guys have almost no anti-gay sentiment, right? Like I have openly gay students in all of my classrooms and it's like never an issue, right? So if there is any anti-gay sentiment, it's hidden pretty deeply, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. All right, so anti-gay sentiment, I'm gonna introduce you to the guy right here, Matthew Shepard, who in 1998, he was, um, he was gay Uh, a gay young man from Wyoming. Um, And this is happening at the same time Ellen's show is on TV, right? So he's a young gay man from Wyoming and um, he comes out of the closet and um, a bunch of people didn't like that. And so um, some guys kind of go to a bar and they trick him into like flirting with them. Um, And then they beat him up and they take him out and they crucify him on the side of the road. Um, and they they hang him up on a on a fence basically, and they crucify him and they leave him for dead. And they leave him for dead on the side of the road. And this is um, so so when Laramie wakes up the next morning, they find that Matthew Shepard has been murdered. Um, this is so dramatic, and this is at a moment where the country is thinking about gay rights, right? That this becomes one of these focal points where where the community gets around and says, oh my gosh, we need to stop this kind of violence. We need to, we need to step in, we need to do something about it. It's gonna become one of these flashpoints for the community. Unfortunately, 
I, uh, I wish it didn't take those kinds of flashpoints to come forward, but um, I think we've seen a bunch of examples of that, right? All right, so let's do some, uh, do you wanna do economics or politics? Um, let's go economics. All right. So economics, by far and away, the, the biggest economic story, uh, well, the biggest economic story is the internet of the 90s, right? But the second biggest one is what we're gonna do here, number V, V stands for NAFTA. NAFTA. Have you heard of NAFTA before? I don't think so. Okay. So NAFTA is an organization that's called the North American Free Trade Agreement. North American Free Trade Agreement. And it's an agreement between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. Basically what it does is it says that between those three countries, Canada, United States, and Mexico, excuse me, between those three countries, there are no trade laws that you can trade openly with all three countries back and forth, right? No taxes at all. So you can like make a t-shirt in Texas and you can sell it in Quebec for exactly the same price. You like, you don't have to pay any tariffs, no taxes, right? Goods are just shipped back and forth up and down Right, which means you can manufacture things in Mexico where it's cheap and you can sell them in America where that's, you know. NAFTA is an agreement between these three countries and it is a massive employment boom. It's a massive economic boom. If you look at these numbers here, we're dealing with $271 billion worth of stuff coming from Mexico into the United States, $255 billion worth of stuff coming from Canada into the United States, right? Like. This is a lot of money, a lot of money, okay? This is a huge, huge deal. Um, the US makes a ton of money off this deal. So does Canada. Mexico goes from being like the 25th largest economy in the world to the 13th largest economy in the world. Ooh. It's pretty cool, right? It's pretty cool. Like you may, you may sit here and pause for a minute and say, why do I care about Mexico? Right? Why do I care about Mexico's growth? Right? But I think you can answer that question on your own. Why should you, an American, care about Mexico's economics? Why should you care? Because they influence us and like sort of by like looking at the thing of like in a way we're all like linked together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If Mexico is stable, if Mexico is rich and stable. Whose stuff are they going to buy? Oh, our stuff. stuff. Our stuff. Right? They're going to buy all the stuff we're making, right? Um, if they're going to buy $200 million worth of stuff, right? And they're going to sell us $271 billion worth of stuff. That's a lot of money, right? And the, the richer Mexico is, the bigger that number is, the higher that number will go, right? Um, and Mexico is going to get the biggest benefit of these three countries, but the United States is going to make a huge benefit as well. Okay, here's the cost, because this isn't you know you don't get anything for free. What's going to be the disadvantage? What's going to be hurt in the United States? Something will be hurt. What do you think? So because we're using like the like you mentioned earlier like things like cheap labor and stuff from mexico that means that people in the u.s are gonna probably like lose jobs because we're gonna look for cheaper alternatives 100 percent correct 100 percent. okay so what happens is americans are going to start losing jobs americans will start losing jobs and american workers wages are going to become stagnant our wages are not going to start growing anymore now, a lot of people will look at this, and this is kind of the same problem we've been talking about since the 70s, right? With deindustrialization. Okay. And people a lot of times will blame Mexico for, for those economic wages. And we get this idea that Mexicans are coming to steal our jobs, right? And they're coming to steal our jobs. And that's why we should all be angry at Mexicans, right? The real fact of the matter is that Mexicans aren't stealing our jobs. Who's stealing our jobs? Who's cutting our wages? The people in charge we're working for. Well, that's true. Well, so that, that is true, right? The company is choosing to spend less money on you, right? 
it's really machines. Computers and machines, by far and away, computers and machines are, are taking the jobs, right? Because Mexico is actually losing jobs to machines also, right? And this also isn't a Mexico problem necessarily because in the 90s, we're also gonna get what's called outsourcing. So we outsource a lot of our jobs to Mexico. So like car manufacturers and stuff, we just build car manufacturing in Mexico where we can pay the workers half of what we pay Americans. But then we're also gonna get manufacturing in like India and Bangladesh and Vietnam and Indonesia and all around the world because it's gonna become so cheap to pay them nothing over there basically, right? And then ship it across the ocean, right? So NAFTA kind of gets a bad reputation from people who don't fully understand global economics very well, right? Um, and it gets kind of that bad reputation, but, but I think that the good things kind of outweigh it. If, if you're asking for my opinion on the issue, I would say that the good outweighs it. Right, we're getting a, a dynamic economic growth in all three countries. All three countries made money off of NAFTA. All three economies grew, Canada, US, and Mexico, all of them grew. Mexico grew more, but Mexico was also poorer, right? So we would expect Mexico to, be, to grow more because it was poorer, right? Adding 5% to a small economy is relatively easy. Adding 5% to a big giant monster economy like the United States, it's not very easy at all, right? Like adding 5% growth to Mexico is the equivalent of adding like 0.5% growth to the United States for the amount of difficulty it is, right? And that's just because we're dealing with much bigger numbers than they are, right? So um, NAFTA is largely a success, but it's also viewed as a failure by a lot of people, right? If we look at just the numbers, I think it's pretty clear that NAFTA is a success. But if we look at the way that people feel, it's not so clear. All right, let's deal with politics real quick and then we're gonna go and then we'll be done. All right, so we're gonna introduce you to this man right here, the most important guy of the 90s that you've never heard of before. Okay, W stands for Newt Gingrich. Oh no, it's U, isn't it? Yeah. I think it, hang on, because T. You, I think we're on W. Oh, V was NAFTA. Yeah. V was NAFTA, W was Newt. Okay, so Newt Gingrich. All right, so Newt Gingrich is this dude right here. This dude right here. Um, I'd like to point out for a moment, he's got a dinosaur tie on. You know, that's kind of cool. I like that. I like that. Um, he is the Speaker of the House during the 1990s. Speaker of the House during the 1990s. Um, do you know what the Speaker of the House is, what that job is? No. Okay, so the Speaker of the House is the leader of the House of Representatives. He's basically the leader of Congress, essentially. Okay, all right. Cool. So he is going to lead um, a conservative revolution in the Congress. Um, he worked with Reagan. He's kind of part of this Reaganizing right, this big, I told you how Reagan was transformative for our process, right? Well, if Reagan, if Reagan is uh, taking the shot and Newt Gingrich is giving the assist on this, right? For mm -hmm. that basketball. Um, Newt Gingrich starts something that he calls a contract with America. His contract with America is a conservative renewal of America. He's pledging to, to, to um, uh, he's, he's pledging to shrink the government and to lower taxes and to bring back conservative Christian values. He is pretty popular in the 90s and he's very powerful. I would say he's more powerful than he is popular. Um, and he is going to very controversially start the process of shutting the government down when the president doesn't want to negotiate with him. Right, you've you've uh, you've lived through at least a couple of government shutdowns. Do you remember when that's happened before? I feel like I have, like I can't remember. Oh, wait, did that happen with the insurrection where it got shut down? No, no. no. Okay. Okay. So what they? I've lived with them, but I can't. You might have been. You were pretty young. So it would have. The last time it happened was like three years ago, 
And so um, you were pretty young when that would have happened and probably not super into like national politics. <laughs> probably not. Because um, you would have been like, what, seven? Something like that. Um, something like that, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so the government shutdown is basically where Congress locks the funding and so they can't pay for anything, basically. Okay, so they lock the funding and so they can't pay for anything. And so it means all the government agencies basically shut down. Okay, so like the Department of Agriculture and Education, the Department of Labor, the Department of Transportation, the Department of like all those departments shut down, the workers don't get paid. Okay. Um, this also includes a lot of things like the National Park Service and stuff. Like you can't go to Yellowstone because the, because the park shut down. You can't do a bunch of these other things, right? Gingrich starts this as a strategy, and he's the first he's the first politician to use that as a strategy. But it's going to become you okay. Okay. So Gingrich is going to start this as a strategy where he shuts the government down as a negotiating tactic. And um, he's the first one to do this, but it's going to become a regular strategy for Republicans moving forward. That Republicans are going to do this. And like under, um, under Obama, by the time we get to electing Obama, the Republicans are going to shut down the government like six or seven times. Yeah. Yeah, um, Gingrich is the one who is most often criticized, credited with political polarization. Political polarization. Do you know what polarization means? It means like sort of with, um, mm -hmm. it makes me think like magnets and stuff and like the drifting apart of things. Exactly, right? What happens if I take a negative magnet and a negative magnet and I put them together? What's gonna happen? And two negatives? Two negatives or they're two gonna, positives. Oh, they're gonna repel each other. Yeah, they're gonna push away from each other, right? That's what political polarization is where all of the work, all of the polit politicians believe further and further away, right? So prior to this, the Democratic Party had conservatives and liberals in it. And the Republican Party had conservatives and liberals in it. Gingrich, Reagan and Gingrich are really going to push it so that the Republican Party has only conservatives and the Democratic Party has only liberals, which is why we have the government we have today where the Republicans and the Democrats seem to hate each other and they seem to never want to work together and they, they seem to never agree to work with each other. They won't pass anything with each other, right? It's why our government hasn't passed a budget since 2005. It's why we haven't we haven't passed the budget since 2005. It's why we haven't been able to get any large scale legislature done really with a few kind of weird exceptions that we can talk about later when they come up. But we haven't really gotten major legislature done in almost 20 years. And that's because neither party is going to work with the other. Right. And that's where we get to this point where today people will say something like, I'm not going to vote for Biden because he's evil and I'm not going to vote for Trump because he's evil, right? Like we're not like, it's no longer like I disagree with them. It's now a saying stuff like the other guy is evil. He's the devil, right? That's political polarization. And this man right here is the guy who gets the most credit for it. Yeah. So way to go, Newt. All right. <laughs> part of his polarization, and let's keep this in with the polarization part. Part of his polarization is the, the impeachment of Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton gets impeached. It's really not very important. Um, it's important because he's only the second president to ever be impeached. Um, but the nature of why he's impeached is not all that important. He wasn't like stealing money or like, you know, uh, being corrupt, government corrupt or anything. He basically gets accused of having sex with this woman, Monica Lewinsky. He gets he's accused of having sex with this woman and then he lies under oath about it. So that's really all it is. It's, 
is he just lies about how he he lies about cheating on his wife essentially right um and it is a so the crime is perjury he was under oath it was it is a crime right it is illegal it is a crime so i don't want you to i don't want you to think it's not a crime i just also think that like of all the things a president could lie about like cheating on his wife is i don't know not that big of a deal you know what i mean like i don't know i it's hard for me to get really worked up about this like how many of these presidents are cheating on their wives like it, it mm -hmm. feels like something that needs to be dealt with with husband and wife like between them you know what i mean like yeah i kind of feel like his wife can punish him worse than anyone else can <laughs> yeah and she should right like if she wanted to mm -hmm. divorce him and take out his money and she wanted like go for it right like that you know what i mean like mm -hmm. i don't know it just it's hard to get worked up about this um the thing is most americans at this time period agree kind of with the way i'm thinking about this that it's not really like an impeachable offense most americans look at this as like newt gingrich went too far and overreacted right and gingrich was really kind of just gunning for clinton in a lot of ways so clinton actually becomes more popular because of this. yeah all right okay i'm gonna leave columbine alone because we're gonna do columbine we'll do a school shooting thing later on we'll do a school we're gonna have a whole lesson on school shooting so i'm gonna do that later on. but i think that's a good place to end in the 90s like Clinton sex scandal. Ugh. Yeah, I just, whatever. Okay. Yeah, and it actually, Clinton has gotten much worse in the Me Too era. Like when we start looking at a lot of things about Clinton, right? Like it's, there's quite a bit of evidence that he was a rapist and that he was, mm. you know, that he, he gets accused of a lot of stuff that people all kind of just wrote off at the time saying, oh, these women are just kind of crazy. As it turns out, they probably aren't crazy. They probably are like, you know, maybe we should have listened to them as it turns out, right? And more, there's kind of like a creepy, weird power thing. Monica Lewinsky is, um, is like an intern. She's only like 20 years old. And he's like, he's like almost 60 years old and he's the president of the United States. And he's like, kind of forcing this 20 year old to have sex with him. Oh, like, that is weird. Yeah, it's some creepy stuff, right? But at the time, everyone was like, oh yeah, he's, he's you know, sleeping with a 20 year old. Yeah, good for him. You know, like, it's pretty gross. If you like look at a lot of the news broadcasts of the time period, like the biggest criticism was that she wasn't pretty enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so messed up yeah it is really messed up it's really messed up but like in the grand scope of american history it's not that important it's just kind of gross and weird mm -hmm. yeah all right so we're gonna leave it there and um next class period i'll introduce you to bush and then we get 9 11. cool yeah. <laughs>